Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise, let them Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee, swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice. And let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from me, filled with messages from me. Take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose, every power. Shall choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be. Take my love, my Lord, I pour At thy feet its treasure store Take myself and I will be Ever only all for
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our online worship here at First CRC. My name is Brian Dunn. I'm the lead pastor here, and it's a blessing and honor to be serving you and worshiping with you as God's people, no matter where we are. You can't help but to, uh, well, at least I can't help but to be a, a little bit heartbroken that uh, we have to move back to online-only services, even though uh, it uh, it was in all likelihood the right thing to have done at this point. Um, still, yeah, it does does break break your heart a bit um, as we, you know, it just feels almost like a step backwards and such. Uh, but just to be clear, we are online only for the next three weeks uh, to be re-evaluated. I think we meet as a council once again um, before Sunday the 23rd, um, and we'll see how the restrictions go and um, what uh, what the, is being proposed at that point then. So be in prayer. And be in prayer for our province, our our government, and of course our church leadership as well, as we consider these these things um, in this strange, strange time we're in right now. Um, well, aside from that, um, there's not too much else to announce at this point. Um, aside from what you can take a look in our bulletin, so let's come together as God's people and heed the call to worship that God gives. Hear these words from Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praises of your name. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Amen. As God calls us into his presence with these words, he now offers his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
called to confession. God's word assures us in 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Let's pray. O Lord, great God, all holy, Father most gracious, filled with mercy and steadfast love, we are embarrassed to come before you. For we have preferred the ways of this world to your ways. For we have rebelled against your wisdom, and we have gotten into trouble. For we have rejected your fatherly guidance, and have gotten lost altogether. To you belongs righteousness, O Lord, and to us confusion of faith. O Lord, great God, all holy, filled with awe, Father, most gracious, filled with mercy and steadfast love, incline your ear to our troubles. Hear us when we pour out our sorrows before you. Forgive us, not on the ground of our own righteousness, but on the ground of your great mercy. On the ground and the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray, for he is our Savior and the mediator of the covenant of grace. Amen. And today's assurance of pardon. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Psalm 103. God's will for our lives comes from Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. So
Well, we are continuing in our adventure through the Gospel of Luke, uh, looking at Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 27. Hear the word of the Lord. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold from them your shirt. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do not do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, <clears throat> what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who, whom, to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to get repaid in full. But love your enemies and do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind and un kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Amen. This is God's word. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that wherever we are, that you would meet us, that you'd open our hearts and minds to display all that you'd have us to see. Give us wisdom, presence, and your peace of mind to discern your word clearly. In the name of Jesus, amen. As we continue through the uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Plain here in Luke chapter 6, we, we come to what is probably the, uh, the, the most well-known and most permeating teaching that Jesus gave. And that's the command to love your enemies. This is a teaching that, that, that really came to define early Christianity. The Apostle Paul expounds on it even more in, 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 in many of his writings, but he does it in a very clear way in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 20, where he says this, On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, the Apostle Peter also reiterates this as well in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, where he says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Now, these ideas were internalized by the early believers in in uh in in the uh good they did rather to the the society that that quite frankly largely wanted to to destroy them at least in the first few centuries of the christian faith now as as a christian you might be willing to to or unwilling rather to sacrifice at the roman temple but you you were you were willing to give of yourself give of your time your energies your efforts to to make sure that your neighbors fields were were tilled and managed even even when that same neighbor might have ridiculed you or maybe even turned you into the authorities for not paying your temple tithe right? as a christian you would still pray for them and offer your food and your goods to their family. This was this was the story for the first two to three hundred years of the Christian faith inside the Roman Empire in which it was birthed. And it began with Jesus telling those who followed him, right, his disciples, that they were to love their enemies, to do good for them, to bless them and pray for them. 
Now, it's worth taking a moment here to, to talk about love from a biblical perspective. This is the first time that, that Luke, in his gospel, actually uses the word in its verbal form. Now, if you've, you've heard of any Greek word before, you've probably heard of this one, right? The Greek word for love. And the word used here specifically, that is agape. Now, in this instance, since it's in its verbal form, it's actually the word agape te. The Greek language has three primary for words for the word love, unlike English, right? We only have one. Each of these words, though, they, they express a different kind of love, right? Different variation on it. Now, this word agape was probably the most vanilla of the three words for love. It's the, the one that you would use that if you were, you were talking about your food or how much you enjoy going for a joy ride. You would say, I agape tacos or I agape long drives in the country. It's kind of like we use our... Our, our word love in English, right? It almost becomes like a junk drawer sort of term for all things that we really, really enjoy. The other words for love in the Greek language, they were more descriptive right? and more specific, right? Specific forms of love referring to friendship or erotic sort of, sort of love. But then, of course, Jesus and his followers come along and they, they sort of hijack this this word agape and they bring a deeper meaning a deeper understanding to the word it became a, the word of choice in the scriptures that defined god's deep and unconditional love for his people right it's 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 the word of choice for how how god's people are then called to love each other and as we see in our context today, it is also the word of choice for how God's people are then supposed to act in love for each other, or, for, or rather for the world around them as well. It became for Christians a love that was filled with action. An action that would, that would put the needs of others over and against their own needs quite frankly. It's a, it's a love that was willing to sacrifice, right? At times a great cost for themselves in order to serve those around them. We define it this way because of, of, of how God's demonstrated his love for his people. Right? The apostle John gives us this definition in his letter when he says, by this we know love that he, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us. It, God's action towards us gives us the defining characteristics of how we then are to love, not just those whom we see as friendly, but also those whom we might consider our enemies as well. This is, keep in mind, this is this is not a call for us to have warm, fuzzy feelings towards those whom we might consider our enemies, right? That's not what we're talking about here in a biblical definition of love. But rather, it's it's to have a caring attitude toward them and also be willing and often give sacrificially and serve them if we can. This command actually easily translates as be loving toward your enemies. Now, believe it or not, this command was just as difficult in Jesus's day as it is for us now, today. The general sentiment of, of uh, uh, Roman and Jewish culture was not an attitude of love at all toward their enemies. The rank and file Roman would have easily got revenge on someone who had 
done them wrong. Israelites, Jewish people, were called to, of course, you know, we see this in the law, to provide or give some sort of care for for foreigners and, and those outside their nation. But if you were not of the same religious mindset, they would not have even considered you their neighbor. Now, let's be frank as well. It was a time in history when if you wanted revenge, it would be much easier for you to get that revenge in Jesus's day. And it's just kind of the way it was. Now, today, you may not be looking for or seeking physical revenge on people, but most of us would, would, would say that they understood why you, why you may have bitterness towards someone who has wronged you. Right? That's often our first reaction towards, towards someone when they have wronged us, right? We, we often harbor bitterness and, and we will do our best to ignore them or castigate them in our mind, um, avoiding them often at all costs. Remember, though, what Jesus is teaching his disciples here. Right? These are ethics of his kingdom. Right? Ethics that, that those people who follow him and claim to be citizens of his kingdom are meant to embody right, and to put on display in your life. And so you need to consider how you respond to those who have wronged you. right? You need to consider this deeply. Right? those people whom you would consider your enemies. Because what Jesus is, is commanding here is a love that is radically different, radically broader than what it might look like or mean to, to, to love anyone, let alone those whom oppose you. Now, how does this work, though? It's challenging as it is, because it no doubt is. Aside from the call to love, to be loving toward our enemies, there are three other specific actions Jesus tells his followers to do. He says, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Do good, bless, and pray. And three things, all three of these actions, put specific legs on the command to love your enemies. All right, first he says, he says, do good to those who hate you. Now this takes this, it, it simply beyond a, a change of attitude or change of mind toward your enemies. Right? To do good is to actually take action and, and, and work in the lives of those who maybe oppose you. This, this should, if you really think about it, make total sense, though. Right? To love your enemies in a biblical way, right? in the way that Jesus is calling you to, right? it requires sacrifice. Making sacrifice requires action. Right? This is exactly what love does, right? This is what it is, right? Love makes demands on us. Remember, right, this kind of love calls you to put your needs right, into the, right, on the back burner in lieu of the needs of another, right? In this case, your enemy. You can and should keep and maintain a good attitude, right? That's that's kind of a given toward those who are against you, right? This is this is all in the background, right? because this is a big part of what Jesus is calling us to do. But if that was the only thing you did, right? Like any expression of love, it has to be accompanied by action, right? It it requires more than just a change of attitude. And it's something that has to be backed up by your deeds, your actions. Think about this. You, you need only go talk to your spouse. You need only, only go talk to other members of your family. 
in order for them to feel your love, right? To feel like the, you care about them, right? they have to see your love in action. For the people closest to you, you, you might you might look to give them a hug and right? some sort of affection, physical affection, right? To show your love to them. It might look like sitting, having a conversation with them as well, listening to them, hearing them out. It might look like going out, weeding the garden when you just don't feel like it, or, or doing your part to care for the rest of the family and help out around the house. These are, these are of course, tangible actions that in some way, shape, or form show love and show care for those whom you, you love and care for in your life. Now, will doing good for someone who opposes you, someone who is your enemy, look different? Probably. Think for a second who this might be in your life. It might be a coworker who constantly gives you grief, constantly getting in your business. Right? Someone who is, who is watching your every move and who has reported you in the past to your supervisor for, for the dumbest of things. It might be that person. It could be that teacher or professor who is snide, who is rude, who says, sure, I would love to help. Just, just if you have a question, I'm happy to answer it. And then you have a question, you ask that question, and the professor or teacher gets gets rude and nasty and snips at you because they, they can't believe that you could have possibly misunderstood the lesson because they, of course, taught it so perfectly. It could be that friend or family member who has abused you, who has taken advantage of you, and now... As you try to engage in that relationship, it's, it's, it's awkward even to be in the same room as them. How do you love these types of people? I would guess, of course, it's going to look differently than how you love those whom you care about the most. But to do good as Jesus calls you to means that you need to play an active role in whatever you do. And while it's good to make the choice to, of course, not chew the person out for at work for being petty, right? you need to ask the question, what can I do for this person? What good can I do for this person? What good could you do for that professor, that, that teacher who seems so sour? And even if at arm's length, right, for, for safety, for, for trauma, whatever the case, even if you have to do it at arm's length, right, can you do good for the person who took advantage of you or even abused you? As hard as this is, and trust me, I make no bones about this. I do believe this is difficult. This is a hard teaching. Right? Because I have people in my life, too, who would probably fall into this, this category of enemy. And right? I get it. It gets even more challenging for us with the next two actions that Jesus calls us to. He says that we are to bless people and to pray for them. Now, initially, I, I would imagine on the surface, as you, as you think about this, you might be thinking that this might be the easiest of the actions that Jesus calls us to. Because right, these things don't necessarily involve face-to-face -face activities. But think about what these two actions call you to do. Think of what a blessing is. A blessing should be understood as, as favor. In this instance, asking God's favor to fall on someone. And then think of what prayer is. Prayer is the means by which you, 
you you ask God to intervene in your life or or intervene in any person's life, right? It's having that conversation with God and asking for these sorts of things. So what this ultimately means is that you're asking for God to soften someone's heart and give them mercy and salvation. Which, of course, if you understand your faith correctly, is the greatest gift that they could ever have. Now, I've, I've heard many people say of people who have hurt them that they hope that there is a special place in hell for them because of what they've done. And I get that. People often say that because they have been hurt so bad. Now, by blessing someone, by praying for them, though, you are asking that God would make a special place in heaven and in his heart for them instead. Think about that. Do you, do you see how radical this is? And think of this, right? Jesus is, is saying this to his followers. Right? They were going to experience such extreme hardship in the, the not-too-distant future. And he's talking to men and women who would, who would be burnt out of house and home, who would, who would be tortured and tormented for the sheer purpose of entertainment in the arenas. Who would, who would literally be used as candle wicks to light Emperor Nero's garden in Rome. These, these are people who were called to then face their persecutors and do good. To show love and offer blessing and prayer for them. In order for them to do this, in order for them to love like this, and in order for you to love like this even today, even now, this requires supernatural, a supernatural experience. And you don't come to these sort of conclusions when you think about your relationships with, you know, think, by thinking rationally. Especially the difficult ones, the challenging ones. It's only when you have experienced the great, the glorious, sacrificial love of Jesus and you hold him as your greatest treasure that you can then turn and look at your enemies in the eye in spite of what they have done and love them no matter what. Verse 29 through 30, Jesus illustrates how this love could look in action. He says, if someone slaps you on, on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes you, takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is that if you are insulted, if you are abused, if you are taken advantage of, you should you should be willing to to endure more of it, if for the sake of the gospel, and for the sake of agape, or love. Why, why is this the case, though? Well, let's not forget, of course, what the Apostle Paul said, expounding on this concept in Romans chapter 12. And he said, in doing this, right, in loving in this radical way, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, on your enemy's head. A willingness to, to take the blows, to to take the abuse, even in moments of injustice. Like there's something about it that has the power to just melt the hearts of your enemies, as well as right the wrongs of injustice done to you 
and done to others. In our recent history, I don't, I don't think these principles have been put on better display than, than the fight for civil rights in the U.S. Many an African American brother or sister, just simply trying to live the life, you know, normal life, and do the things that that we take for granted, such as send their kids to the best schools with the best teachers and the best curriculum to just simply trying to ride a bus like nobody else or like everybody else rather to eat in a diner that wasn't segregated. These simple acts of, of civil disobedience were, were often met with abuse, with threats Threats against their lives, against their families, with horrible insults, and fire hoses being opened on, on crowds as they protested, murders, all of these in a in in a, in a process of getting society to recognize the God given image that is in everyone, no matter your skin color. It can easily, I think it often does, easily get forgotten that the civil rights movement in the U.S. was was actually a religious movement. And it was a, a movement inspired by Jesus' teaching like, like this. And of course, led in part by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And this was part of his goal. Martin Luther King Jr.'s book, Strength to Love, he wrote this. He said, through nonviolent resistance, we shall be able to oppose the unjust system and at the same time, love the perpetrators of the system. And while it took time, while it took incredible energy, eventually this love in action began to melt the hearts of the public and sentiment began to sway. And well, yes, of course, there is still work to be done. It is amazing to think of the work that was done by people who lived out in real ways the call that Jesus gives for us to love our enemies, even if they were abused by them. The linchpin of this passage culminates in verse 31. What we commonly call as the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, as we read this verse, there are no strings attached to it. Especially given the broader context, right? To love our enemies. It is not do to others as, as you would do to them so that they might do well to you, right? Nor is it do well to others if they do well to you. There are no conditions. There are no conclusions. Just simply consider how you would prefer to be treated and treat others the same. Now, given the context of loving your enemies, as I said, it's even in those instances, right, when you are being treated poorly, because in spite of what is happening, people do not want to be treated poorly. And even if the person treating you poorly, of course, is, is acting in sin and hurting those around them, right? the call is still to do to them as you would have done to you. Now the big question we're left with is why? Why do we as Christians, followers of Jesus, need to act this way? I think I've alluded to plenty of reasons, but let me sum it up because that's basically what Jesus does here in these closing verses, verses 32 through 36. First, we love even when people are unlovely because this shows the radical, amazing love 
that God gives, which is distinct from anything that we see in this world. And all of us are willing and do show amounts of love to people that we care for, people whom we are close with in our lives. Right? We are, we are happy to treat people well and do good for them when they do good to us. Right? We are even willing to help, to reach out, to lend, to give to those whom we know would, would then turn and do the same for us. But the radical love of God loves those who don't love him. In fact, God's love is so grand, so powerful, that he, he loved those who rejected him, who nailed him to a cross after a sham, unfair trial and a conviction without just cause. And yet, this was the greatest display of his love for those same people. God, in the person of Jesus, knowing there was no way for us to be restored into right relationship with him, without him taking grave action and intervening, gave his life. Right? He paid the penalty for our sin so that we might be restored to right relationship with God. And he rose to life three days later. This great act of mercy, this great act of love is meant to be the defining act of what it means to be a Christian. Because, because from that defining act flows everything we do, right? how we interact with each other, and of course, how we interact with the world around us. How then does this gospel message, right, this, this truth of Jesus' life-giving love define and affect all of the relationships that you have in your life, whether they are good relationships or bad ones? Second, as we consider the truth of the gospel, and what that means for our lives, and what Jesus has done for us. And when we have that in our minds, when we hold that as our greatest treasure, and we, can, we can love radically, even those who hate us, because we, have, we, we know that we already have the greatest reward possible, Jesus himself. And verse 35 tells us that, that our reward will be great and you will be the children of the Most High. And in Christ, you are God's child. And even though your sin, my sin, nailed Jesus to the cross, even though Scripture describes us as God's enemies, right, Jesus still died for you. He still accepted you. He still adopted you into his family as his child. And all this comes to you as you trust in his son. There can be no greater reward if you have trusted in Jesus as your savior. Because that reward is yours here, now, today. And so knowing that you can give of yourself freely as a display of the mercy, as a display of the grace that God has given you in Christ. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we are called to be a people of conviction, not conformity, of moral no no nobility, excuse me, not social respectability. We are commanded to live differently and according to a higher loyalty. As you consider your relationships, good, bad, friend or foe, what loyalty is on display in those relationships? Is it a higher loyalty? A loyalty to a kingdom that is not of this world? 
Or is the love you display selective and similar to those who wouldn't even claim to be following Jesus? Your love for everyone is a direct display of the love or the one who who loves you and forgave you. How are you displaying that love and loyalty for all the world to see? Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would continue to move and work in our hearts. This is without a doubt a hard teaching. A teaching that challenges challenges us. A teaching that calls us to do things that it's hard to even imagine. But Father, you don't leave us to do these things on our own. You have sent us your spirit. You have empowered us through his work. You've given us the example of Jesus, who on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Grant us your grace. Grant us your wisdom as we discern how to interact in our relationships. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
there is plenty to be praying for in our uh, congregation, um, including plenty of people who are actually dealing with COVID and, of course, issues relating to COVID in their families and in their homes. Um, they're mentioned in the in the bulletin. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, if you've received it by email, you hear me talk uh, mention them in the prayer as well. So keep that in mind. Um, as well as uh, broadly, uh, yeah, we just need to continue to keep praying for our province as well and uh, everything that it continues to endure and uh, people here continue to endure. I just want to say a big thanks uh, as well to everyone who held us up in our prayers or your prayers rather. Um, we, of course, I just came off isolation this past week and uh, we had a close exposure ourselves and nobody, nobody ended up being sick or, or even bearing any symptoms or anything of that sort. Uh, but uh, two weeks of isolation, that's uh, that's tough. And so those of you who have done had to do more, I, I feel for you now. This is actually the first time that we've had to had to do anything like this. And um, uh, so, yeah, we, uh, you know, I'm uh, a bit more empathetic now for sure. <laughs> you, know, you you tend that tends to happen when you when you have to do something like this anyway so uh but anyways just uh just thank you for your prayers and your concern for us during this time and for everyone who helped us with groceries and, and things of that sort we are we are grateful for that okay let's come to the lord in prayer this morning let's pray father you are the god who hears prayer who calls us to come to you humbly, yet boldly. Father, we are a blessed people with the opportunity and the ability to draw near to you through the gifts that you have given. And so, Lord, we stand and thank you for all you have done and continue to do in our lives. Lord, it goes almost without saying that anxiety is high and that patience are wearing thin for many people. That's in all likelihood the reason why we are in the position that we are in as a province. With numbers rising and fear spreading, I pray you would give signs that your hand is in all this, Lord. Even in the worst of circumstances, you can still bring forth light. And so I pray we would see the sun shining through. Even if only a crack, Lord, it still gives us so much hope. I pray you would give wisdom and guidance to our leadership, our government. And I pray that you would help them to set policies in place that deal with the crisis at hand, of course, Lord but also the long-term ramifications of all that could be. I ask that you you strengthen them, give them resolve, as well as focus and clarity of mind. Father, we pray for those in our congregation who are dealing directly with this virus. It has not hit us hard overall until now, and rather suddenly at this point, Lord, but... We pray that you would keep all of our people safe and healthy with this in mind. We pray that, especially for Glenn and Julie and their family, and in Julie in particular, who seem to have caught the brunt of the virus in their household. It is good that they are on the mend, of course, Lord, we praise you for that. But we pray that you'd continue to strengthen them as well and bring them to full health. Lord, we pray the same for Will and Arenda and their family. It's good to hear as well of how Parker was able to make it through and recover and how well he handled it. There is still some isolation left for their family. 
And so, Lord, we ask for a hedge of protection around them as well. Is your presence, pray that your presence was with them, Lord, as they continue to isolate. Lord, we pray for Kara and her girls. They are fighting this thing pretty strongly right now, and it just seems to bounce from one girl to the next. It's crazy. Lord, we pray that you would keep them healthy and safe. We pray that you'd strengthen them. Lord, give them your resolve. Send your spirit upon them as they combat this virus. Keep them healthy and safe as well. Father, we pray for Noah as well. Pete and Joanne's grandson. We pray that as he recovers from his concussion, all would continue to go well. It is good to know that the scans came back with good news and there is no internal damage. But it is still, of course, certainly a, a, a sensitive situation, especially for a young guy like Noah, who just wants to be up moving, enjoying himself all he can, Lord. But we pray for patience and peace as he continues to heal. Father, we... May we be a people who display your glory for the whole world to see. May we love the unlovely and give grace to all. May your name be glorified in all the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to worship, we worship God with our offering. Our offering this week will be for Adira. Adira is a, a, a women's program that helps women dealing with addiction, poverty, trauma, all different kinds of stuff, especially coming out of abusive situations and things of that sort. And so if they are a program that is on your heart, if that is a, a, a cause that is on your heart, I pray that you would give graciously. Um, they, like everyone else, are dealing with the ramifications of, of uh, COVID and um, you know they... They need to be able to make it through these tough times as well. Uh, I say that, and I mention the church as well. And I pray that you continue to give graciously to the church all that we do here, including benevolence, keeping the lights on, and things of that sort. Well, go as God's people to love and serve the Lord, showing blessing, giving grace, and love to everyone friend or foe. Receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. And all God's people everywhere said, Amen. Have a great week. We will see you online next Sunday.
But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey.